Hello, we're sp um, going to start working on To Kill a Mockingbird study lecture notes for chapter 17. I'll be turning the screen back and forth as I go when I'll read the notes that you should have gotten from my class. You either got them online or emailed to you. If not, no worries, the notes will be right here. When we do questions, consider pausing your video for a moment, in which case you can think about an answer that you might like to give, and then I will give you some possible responses to those questions. Remember, answers I give you doesn't mean they're the only answer or the best answer. They're just a possible answer and something to think about. So chapter 17 notes, reading from the screen that you should have with you. Mr. Gilmer, the prosecutor, begins his case by having Sheriff Tate relate the incidents of the evening of November 21. Bob Ewell was called because he claimed his daughter Mayella was raped by Tom Robinson. When the sheriff arrived, Bob Ewell said he found Mayella beaten and bruised. When the sheriff is cross-examined, the sheriff admits the doctor was not called and the bruises were on the right side of her face. So, first thing before we go to the questions that are possible here. A prosecuting attorney is the attorney who is for the person who accused someone of a crime. So, Mr. Gilmer is defending Mayella Ewell, and I guess kind of by proxy, Bob Ewell, her father, who is kind of controlling here. Whereas, Atticus Finch is a defense attorney who is defending Tom Robinson. As we learned in earlier chapters, Mayella roughly 17 or so years old, um, was the girl who accused Tom of rape. We'll find out a lot more about this later. But in the testimony, we did learn that Mayella was beaten and bruised and um, the doctor wasn't called. And so one thing that makes us think here is, wow, we know that the Yules are poor, but if your daughter was raped, you would want to contact a doctor to see if you know, she could get help if she was injured, if there was some significant injury that needed to be attended to, but he didn't do that. And so that's just something that's going to make us think we'll deal with this in a bit. I'm going to flip the screen around here and um, we'll look at some more, a couple of questions here. So first of all, the top question, number one, based on the reading, what was the social status of the Ewell family in Maycomb? Now that has nothing to do with the notes that were written. It has to do with the chapter itself. So in Maycomb, we said Maycomb was primarily a very poor town. We also said this was the Depression era, so almost everybody was hurting. So the Finches, Atticus said they were poor, but they were far better off than anybody else. They had a nice home. They were able to have um, Calpurnia to help them. They had food. They had means. Atticus, as a lawyer, was better off than many, but still considered them poor. Most of the people in Maycomb were just generally poor, didn't have more than just enough to get by. But the Yules were considered from a social status, which is the money status, they were considered the poorest of the poor. You'll actually learn later, they actually live just, just a side of the garbage dump. Um, homes there would have literally no value because people are not looking to live next to the garbage dump. So they were in an area of town where clearly they were able to get this land or afford this land. Um, and so it was just like a, the lowest financial um, situation of the mom. But also in terms of attitude and mindset, the Yules, by their actions, were considered low-class people. Not money anymore, but the Yules were seen. So the people were very racist. We talk about the evil of the racism, whereas the white people were in one category and the African Americans were in another. And it was evil and wrong, and we obviously understand how horrible that was. Well, the Yules were in a class in between. They were not considered equal with the white people, but because his skin was white in that evil era, he was still considered ahead of people that had darker skin color. So they were in their own social status that way as well. Flipping the camera around, top of your screen, Yule says that he was coming home and he heard his daughter yelling. And when he looked in the window, he claimed Tom Robinson was raping her. Tom left the house and Ewell went inside to check on his daughter. When he was asked why they didn't call a doctor, he said it wasn't that serious and besides, it would cost money. We talked about this a little bit earlier and the questions may leave us that way as well. But that was the testimony that Bob Ewell gave on the, the witness stand when he was asked what happened 
on that evening. While we're here, question two, and I'm going to probably scroll this down just a little bit here and make this more efficient to look at. There we go. So I'll scroll this up here. So we want to comment on the irony of this quote from Bob Ewell. He was speaking about the area near his home. He lived near the dump. The African-Americans lived on the other side of that dump away from the white people. And his comment was, I've asked this county for 15 years to clean out that nest down yonder. They're dangerous to live around, besides devalue on my property. So he was making a racist comment in a quote in the courtroom about how he wanted that area cleaned up and saying that, well, because he didn't like African-Americans, he felt that Tom Robinson raped his daughter because he had opportunity to do that because um, of, again, it was totally wrong, but it was Bob's like racist ramblings. And so now the question to you, if you're going to pause this and think about it, what was ironic that he made a comment that the African-American people were bringing down or devaluing his property? And again, pause if you need um, to think about that, but I'll go through an answer for you right now. So what I want you to understand there is his house was worth nothing. Nobody would have ever wanted his property. It had no value. And yet his racist comment was that, oh, the people who have dark skin, they are devaluing my property. Garbage. It was Bob Yule who devalued himself and his own property, didn't take care of his things that he did have. Um, they, they could have lived at least nicely, but you'll, you saw throughout the story, they didn't take care of their thing, their home. It was mostly him. Um, so that was kind of his deal. Let's turn the screen back here a little bit. Atticus had Yule write his name, and the jury sees that he's left handed. The person who made the bruises on the right side of Mayella's face was likely to be left-handed. So let's read the question first, and then we'll talk about this. What was Atticus trying to prove about Bob Ewell by showing that Mayella was battered by someone who was left-handed? And then also, you're going to describe the feeling in the main courtroom and the main feeling in the balcony when this testimony took place. And at any point you need to pause to think about these, go ahead. So first, I'm going to talk about the top part of that. So, so Atticus is a lawyer. His job is to create reasonable doubt in the mind of the jury. He does not have to prove that Tom Robinson didn't do this or he's innocent. He simply had to prove there was reasonable doubt that he possibly did not commit this crime. And so what Atticus got from the doctor's report, or not the doctor's report, but the, the sheriff's report, was that the bruises were on the right side of Mayella's face. Atticus was a smart lawyer. He was trying to poke holes in an argument. And he realized from knowing the town forever, hmm, being left-handed is pretty rare. He knew on his own that Bob was left-handed. So in the testimony in court, Bob Ewell has no idea this is coming. He tells him to write his name. And then he puts it on the record in court, the dude's left-handed. Hmm, the bruises were from a left-handed person. We'll talk more about the significance of this testimony later, but you'll see what Atticus did right here. So that's the first part of the question. That's what he was trying to prove by showing Mayella was battered at by someone's left-handed thing. Hmm, maybe Tom didn't rape her. Maybe Bob Ewell hit his daughter, bruised her because he was abusive, and then decided so as not to get in trouble, I'm going to pin my crime on somebody else who the court won't say anything about. That's what Atticus is trying to accomplish here. And then the second part when we asked you about the feeling in the main courtroom and the main feeling in the balcony. So remember, it was segregated in the courtroom. And the white people were on the main floor. And you could tell in a courtroom like that that they were probably like, oh, wow. Bob Ewell may have hit his daughter. Now, understand, they're not, the charge is rape, but doesn't mean that Bob Ewell is said to rape his daughter. It, that was the claim that Bob Ewell made about Tom because he knew at that time that rape would be an execution case, that if, if Tom was guilty, he would die for it. So instead of saying he hit my daughter, he decided to claim rape, okay? So the people on the main floor of the courtroom, though, they were shocked because they knew what Atticus was doing, and they realized, oh, this doesn't seem to fit right here. And you'll learn more about the Tom Robinson angle of this later. But for right now, that was the feeling. And then in the balcony where the African-American people sat, they got a feeling, oh, wow. Usually in a courtroom, it's their word against ours, and we never win. But now all of a sudden, Atticus has shown something here. And so there was a little bit of hope 
in the balcony of that courtroom that Tom Robinson, who they knew was a good man, likely did not do this and maybe be found innocent for it. Okay, that's the end of chapter 17. So thank you for watching this video. I'll film separate videos for each of the chapters and label them such on YouTube. Thank you again for listening.